Thank you so much, Rabbi, for joining us. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. I, I want to thank Rabbi Klein. Just one chesed has made a major difference in many different charities. Um, the reality is what Just One Chesed does is it enables charities to really function in a way that's smooth, where the funding goes to the causes that are that it's directed, not to overhead, and call a kavod to Just One Chesed. Um, this morning, and I want to apologize, this afternoon, for those of you in Israel this evening, we have the great opportunity of probably reliving and re-experiencing maybe the greatest event in Jewish history since Hanukkah. We have not had anything like this in 2000 years. And you have to understand the events of 1967, June 1967, come in the aftermath of the worst destruction in Jewish history, of course, the Holocaust, the Shoah. And what this event did, not only for Israeli Jewry, but for world Jewry, it ultimately shaped our destiny. We're gonna go into every bit of detail before we relive the six days of the, of the Sheshit Yamin, of the Six Day War, what we're going to do first and foremost is lead, go into the backdrop. What led up to these events? And, and I wanna go back to 1956. 1956, of course, you're familiar with the Sinai campaign. Those who may not be familiar with the Sinai campaign, just understand this. They did a study in the 1970s. What was the most recognized face across the globe, across the whole globe? The number one most recognized face was that of Muhammad Ali. The second most recognized face was the man with the patch, was Moshe Dayan. What made him famous? 1956. The Egyptians, who at that point were the most dominant Arab nation on the earth, they, along with the other Arab nations, they said this terrible mistake of Jews, of Jewish infidels having land on land that should be Muslim land, we, we cannot tolerate this. Now, they tried to destroy and annihilate the small Jewish issue in 48. It didn't work. In fact, the opposite happened, that Israel went from being a tiny sliver, the UN partition plan, to an expanded, not a safe state, not a secure state, but an expanded piece of land. So what did Egypt say? We'll choke them to death. If we haven't been able to do it militarily, we'll choke them to death. The Israel had been closed off by land. They were landlocked to the north by the Lebanese and the Syrians, to the east by the Jordanians, and to the south by the Egyptians. But there were three ways that Israel could get imports and exports out. Whether it is the Jaffa orange, you know, exporting it to the world. Israeli agriculture, right? Today it's high tech. At that time it was agriculture. But how do you get resources into Israel? So let's, let's take a step back. The very first Israel bonds project, the very first Israel bond project was what? David Ben-Gurion came to America, came to Europe, and they sold Israel bonds. For what purpose? A 24-7 drudging project to give Israel a deep sea port in Haifa. The second Israel bonds project was a 24-7 drudging project to give Israel a deep sea port in Ashdod. So they had access to the Mediterranean through Haifa and Ashdod, okay? Here's the problem. You can't run a society, you can't run an economy unless you have petroleum, you have fuel resources. So what happened? That they would get through a lot because the only, the only oil producing nation in the world that was selling Israel oil, you know what that was? The only one, Iran. Not the Iran of today, of the Shia Mullah, of the most tyrannical reign on earth. At that time, it was under the Shah. It was actually under the Shah's father. And what would they do? They would ship through the Straits of Tehran, right? The city of Sharm el-Sheikh by the Straits of Tehran into what? Into a lot, into the Eilat deep seaport. What did Egypt do? they were gonna choke off the Jews. A very narrow strait to get into the Gulf of Aqaba, that very narrow strait at the Straits of Tehran, they shut it down. No ships could get to the Eilat port. So Moshe Dayan led an expedition, an incredible, incredible military feat with the support and the backing, you know, in terms of equipment from the French and the British, went through the Sinai Desert 
all the way through the Sinai Desert, which was Egyptian, to the Straits of Tehran, and they opened, they took it over, and they opened it up. So Israel would have the rights of every other nation on earth. They would have access to international waters. The world went crazy. The world went nuts on Israel in 1956. And who was the worst? President Dwight D. Eisenhower. And they threatened embargo on Israel. They threatened all kinds of issues and problems. So Israel had a South African immigrant. His name was Aubrey, but you're not gonna get very far in Israeli politics with the name Aubrey. He changed his name to Abba Ibn. Abba Ibn negotiated a deal through the United Nations where Israel would give back the Sinai, give back the Straits, Sharm el Sheikh, the Straits of Tehran, back to Egypt, but there would be a United Nations peace force. It was called actually the UNEF, the United Nations Emergency Forces, and an international body of soldiers would protect ships going into Israel and guarantee Israel the rights of every other nation while giving it back to Egypt. Now, this was, in retrospect, a terrible, horrific move. In retrospect, why? Because do you want the world protecting you? Isn't that the problem we had for 1900 years as exiles? That we were not dependent upon ourselves and God Almighty, but upon others? And that's how all the tragedies were perpetrated? This mistake, by the way, would be repeated by Tsipi Livni and by Ehud Omer in 2006 when they allowed for a UNIFIL to be, so to speak, this international monitoring group that would protect Israel from the attacks from the Hezbollah. We know where that has gotten us. It's gotten us 150,000 rockets on our northern border that can reach almost any part of Israel. But this mistake made by Abba Ibn, with all of the best intentions, I, wanna, I don't want to be critical, but with all the best intentions, what happened was it got Israel 11 years of peace. During these 11 years, there's a man by the name Shkolnik. Again, you don't make it very far in Israeli politics, being a Ukrainian Ashkenazic immigrant with the last name Shkolnik. So he changed his name to Levi Eshkol. Levi Eshkol became the agricultural minister and he created a national project that compared to all national projects, there was never ever a project where such a large percentage of the GNP was invested in this project. It's called Hamovil Haartzi, the national water carrier. What did the national water carrier do? There was only one source of natural water, I'm sorry, of drinkable water, of usable water, and that was the Kinneret. It would have underground pipes taking the water from the Kinneret throughout the length and breadth of Israel. So Israel, which is primarily desert, could be developed because it would have the most precious need, water. When the Arabs saw this, particularly the Syrians, they said this great mistake is gonna be, you couldn't, it, they'll be able to double, triple, quadruple their population. We're gonna stop this. And how'd they stop it? They started building dams to shut down and prevent all the water that would flow into the Jordan River, that would flow into the Kinneret, and they'll choke the Jews. They'll choke them. Just like the Egyptians tried to choke us not getting petroleum, we're gonna choke the Jews from their water source. Israel went and blew up the dams in Syria. The world condemned Israel. It humiliated Syria. No one condemned Syria for damming up the water supply to Israel. But what happened was, what happened was, it showed that Israel could protect itself. I want to do one other piece of information before we get to 1967. The Arabs could not defeat Israel at this point. It was a humiliation to them. There are so many more countries, so many more armaments, so many more soldiers, and we can't defeat the Jews. What we're gonna do is exactly what the Iranians are trying to do to us today. Iran, thank God, thank the Almighty, is not capable of defeating Israel. But what do they try to do? Wear us down with a proxy fight. Hezbollah sending rockets. Hamas sending rockets who killed the little kid with a mortar shell, you know, who's down in the Southern communities on the Gaza border when he's out playing. We're gonna send Hezbollah operatives to blow up a building 
Dean Israeli consulate building in Buenos Aires, you know, will kill the Israeli tourists when they get off the bus in Sofia, Bulgaria, when they get onto the bus at the airport in Sofia, Bulgaria. Step by step, we're just gonna wear down Israel. We'll try to win a war of attrition. And I gotta tell you, it was working. There was something that was created in 1964 called the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Now, what's very important that the world doesn't appreciate, this is three years before the Six Day War. There was no Judea and Samaria in Jewish occupied control. Baloney, it was Jordanian, okay? The Gaza was Egyptian. What happened? They used primarily from Syria, but also from, also from Jordan. Because understand this, Israel in its narrowest point was only nine miles wide. Do you know a PLO terrorist could have like one of those rocket propelled uh, shoulder held rockets? Could try to take down a plane landing in the Lod airport. Today it's renamed Ben Gurion, but at that time it was the Lod airport. That's how close. All the high point was in Jordan. Strategically, Israel was a was literally target practice for the Arabs on those Jordanian mountains. So what happened? The, these is PLO terrorists would come in, kill a mother while she's taking her kid to the, the playground. They would kill a farmer on his tractor in the Galilee. In this war of attrition, it is wearing down and wearing down Israel. And understand this, what do you think everybody saw on the front page of the newspaper? Another person killed, another Jew killed. Finally, the government had to act. And at that time, the head of the IDF was Yitzhak Rabin. He sent in two things. He sent planes in to Syria. And the Syrians took, had Russian MiGs. There was a dogfight. Remember, Israel didn't have American military equipment at that time. They had French jets, the Mystere and the Mirage. The most powerful weapon in the Middle East was the Soviet MiG jet. The Syrians had them. And Israel took down the MiGs. And while Syria was broadcasting that they had shot down the Israeli planes and, and taken the, the Israeli Air Force uh, pilots as, as captive, what did the Jews in Damascus, while they were screaming in the street for Arab power, they looked up. What the Israeli Air Force did was they made hakafot around Damascus as the crowd was out there. And they're looking up to this mug in David. And they realized that their government lied to them. And from Jordan, because King Hussein, who was getting American support, he was being supported by America, the Johnson administration. He played a, 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 what we say shtick, you know what I mean? He was manipulative. He would tell the Americans he's stopping the PLO. He's preventing them from, from, from going into Israel. Yeah, he would arrest them today. And then they let him out of prison in two days from now. And they played that game. So what Robin did was he went into Janine to clean out the hornet's nest. And as he went into Janine, which was one of the PLO bases, what happened? The Israeli soldiers stumbled upon the Royal Jordanian Army. Now, the Royal Jordanian Army, those, those what we'll call Jordanian military, they were well-trained and they were very capable. They were good soldiers. We'll come back to them later. And a major fight broke out. Israel won, but both sides had significant casualties. It humiliated King Hussein because King Hussein's, so to speak, sovereignty and territory was broached. And it made Israel look bad also. It sent a message, you better not mess with the PLO, but Israel got its hand slapped by everyone for doing this. Right? Nobody, nobody goes to town against Jordan and Syria for sicking the PLO on these, these terrorist raids into Israel. But Israel, it, nothing's changed in 55 years. Nothing has changed. But Israel is condemned for what? Israel's condemned for reacting. And this is all leading up, okay? Now, while this is going on, that Syria is getting smashed by Israel for allowing the PLO to attack us. Jordan, Jordan is being humiliated for allowing the PLO to attack us. Gemal Abdul Nasser, there are two men in Egypt Gemal Abdul Nasser, I mean, this is literally, he looked like Omar Sharif, you know, a movie actor, good looking guy and a heck of an orator. 
this guy was an orator and he would get up. You know, he, he had a coup and the, his partner was General Amir. He was the head of the Egyptian military. What would he do? He'd get up in Tahrir Square and he'd give a drusha, you know, they have the microphones and you had a lot of unemployment. You had a very poor economic situation. Because one thing about Nasser, he always had a great speech. He was a terrible, terrible administrator and his government was fairly dysfunctional. And he would rile up these people because it's like every other dirty politician. The people are frustrated with their government for not feeding them, not taking care of them. So you've got to take that anger and that animosity and channel it. Who is the easiest one to channel that animosity at? The Jews. So what was the drusha? And many of you have heard this. We will make the Mediterranean Sea red with the blood of the Jews. It will be flowing red with Jewish blood. The sand of Palestine will be drenched with the blood of the Zionists. And he is giving his drusha. And the people are saying, Halachba. They're going wild. They love it. They love it. What happened? The Syrians are saying, listen, you want to be the big king of the Arab world. You're the big man, huh? We're getting smacked. We're getting slapped by the Israelis. You do nothing. You do nothing to protect us. You just are a big, bad talker. You know what you are? And they start, you know, they refer to him as names. And there's a lot of tension. And Nasser realizes he had overstepped his bounds with every speech and every drusha and no action. And they called him out on it. And they referred to him in some very unkind, ugly terms in Arabic that he had to act. You know, sometimes you talk too much, you put yourself in a position. And it was worse because General Amir, you know, Gamal Abdul Nasser may have been looked upon as the leader of the Arab world because his speeches were broadcast throughout the Islamic countries, throughout the Muslim countries, his speeches were broadcast. Okay. But, but what you have is the Arab world's looking up to him, but he's not acting. And Amir controls the military. Gamal Abdul Nasser can be the biggest talker when the military and all of the sources of power are controlled by General Amir. Gamal Abdul Nasser is totally dependent on Amir. It was like a love-hate relationship. And all of this background is crucial because Amir says to him, you better act. You better act. He forces his hand. Now, the UNEF, the United Nations Emergency Forces, they're the ones who control supposedly the Sinai Desert, the Northern Sinai, the Southern Sinai, the Gaza Strip, the Straits of Tiran, T-I-R-A-N, going into what? Going into the Gulf of Aqaba, going into a lot. So they control all of this. Gamal Abdul Nasser, on May 16th, 1967, he calls in the head of the UNEF. He says, I'm giving you 48 hours, 48 hours to get all of your troops out of here. This is Egyptian sovereignty. We don't want foreigners and for sure not foreign soldiers. And if you don't leave within 48 hours, I will not guarantee your safety. The head of the UNEF, he calls the Secretary General of the UN, a man by the name of Uthant. Uthant was from Burma. And Uthant says to him, pull your troops out. He doesn't want us there, pull your troops out. Now you understand, this violated everything that the French, the British, the Americans, and the United Nations all signed on just 11 years earlier. Abba even said, what is the purpose of an umbrella if when it rains, you close the umbrella? 
Israel was caught off guard. The world was caught off guard. In fact, the world doesn't even know about it because Uthant, the head of the, the Secretary General of the UN, he doesn't even call an emergency meeting. He doesn't even call the, the United Nations Security Council to meet. So after everyone's left, the world finds out about it. The one who was the most surprised at all of this was Gamal Abdul Nasser. The one who was the most surprised at this was General Amir. They're shocked. They are shocked. And what do they do? They took 84,000, I repeat, 84,000 troops because they'd been fighting a war in Yemen against the Saudis. They called the Saudis and said, look, let's put this whole thing on hold. One thing we can all agree upon, this is our chance to finally remove the Zionists and we're going for it. Syria pledges allegiance to Egypt. Jordan pledges allegiance, allegiance to Egypt. And they start sending in 84,000 troops in a week into Southern Sinai. And they move their way into the Northern Sinai, into Gaza. Israel is in a crisis mode, a crisis mode. Because Egypt alone had 1,700 brand new Soviet tanks, 500 MiG jets, okay? The MiG jet was the most powerful weapon on earth. The MiG jet could have annihilated Israel, Egypt without any help whatsoever. But Iraq was now sending soldiers to its western border into Jordan. Jordan pledged to join Egypt. In fact, there was a very, very antagonistic relationship between King Hussein and Gamal Abdel Nasser. Hussein comes and he's greeted at the airport by General Amir to show that they are one. They call it the UAR, the United Arab Republic. What was it united for? the annihilation of the Jews, the annihilation of the state of Israel, the Jewish homeland. This period, starting with May 16th, is the beginning of maybe the most tense period, or one of the most tense periods in the existence of Israel. It's called the Hamtana, the waiting period. The waiting period. What happened during the waiting period? The first thing that Levi Eshkul did and you have to understand, the ones who were the catalyst, who, who got everybody riled up were the Soviets. The Soviets lied to the Arabs. Now the Arabs could have found out on their own and Israel said, we will show you, but the Soviets lied to the Arabs that Israel was building up troops on the Syrian border. They were gonna invade Syria. The Soviets said this to the Egyptians, they said it to the Syrians. And in, in, in even though there were no diplomatic relations, Israel sent messages all across, okay, to the Egyptians, to the Syrians, to the Jordanians that we only wanted peace. And in fact, that year on Yom Ha'atzmaut, which was always a military component to the parade, think about in Israel, the Yom Ha'atzmaut parade, they toned down, they held off, you know, showing off their military equipment. They had the B'nai Akiva and they had the other youth groups doing flag dances. They wanted to totally calm this thing down. And what did the Arabs do? They totally misinterpreted it. They said, you know why there's no military equipment at the Yom Ha'atzmaut, at the Israel, Israel Independence Day Parade? Because it's all on the border, being prepared to attack us. That's why. They sent Abba Ibn, who at this time was a foreign minister. They sent him three places to meet with Charles de Gaulle. And remember, France is the primary provider, primary provider of military equipment to Israel. They sent him to France, to England, to, to Prime Minister Wilson, and then to the United States. And we're gonna get into Lyndon Baines Johnson and Secretary of State Dean Russ. We'll get into that in a minute. So what happened? He comes to Paris to meet with de Gaulle. Prime Minister de Gaulle says to him, don't you dare attack them first. Don't you dare attack them first. If you do, look, he, he used his finger, he lectured Abba even. If you disobey my orders, if you disobey my orders, you'll never get a, forget about a French plane or a French tank, you'll never get a French bullet. Abba even said, we didn't start this. You know we didn't start this. 
And if they attack us first, we may not survive. We're, what about what you signed on to in 1956? You were the one who, were, who encouraged us to open up and give Israel the rights of every other nation. Right now, we're back to 1956. The Egyptians will not allow any ship into the Gulf of Aqaba. They've closed down the Straits of Tehran. They're trying to choke us. You signed on to that. What did de Gaulle say to him? That was 1956. This is 1967. What did he mean? That was 1956. This is 1967. Today, oil meant a lot more to the French economy and they were dependent upon Arab oil. And not only that, France didn't want to start up with the Soviets because Russia was controlling the military. They were the military advisors. They were the ones providing munitions. They didn't want to go stand up against the Russians, the Soviets, because that's what Egypt was. It was another battleground for the Soviet Union. That's what Syria was. He walked out of there humiliated, Abiba. He went to England. And Prime Minister Wilson was very kind to him and very nice to him, but England could only give him nice words, wouldn't back him. And then he went to America. Now understand this, JFK was no friend of Israel. I know he says he was, and I know we think he was. The reason that historian Michael Oren shared with me, the reason that David Ben-Gurion resigned is because the first time Ben-Gurion met with Kennedy, it was probably the first time that he met directly with an American leader was in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York. And Kennedy said to him, we know you have, nu you have a nuclear uh, plan there. We know about the Mona. And you've been lying to us. And what you've been showing us is not the whole story. And I'm going to tell you this. You either come clean with this and you play with us because the big issue for JFK was nuclear, prolif not proliferation, but deproliferation. You either come clean with us or if you don't, there's going to be embargo on you, and there are going to be consequences. When JFK was assassinated, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who was the Senate Majority Leader originally from the state of Texas, LBJ becomes the vice president, not someone beloved by the Kennedys, but they needed him because he represented the party. And what happened? LBJ made a statement. It was true. He said, John Fitzgerald Kennedy was a friend to the state of Israel, a good friend. Today, you are getting an even greater friend. He said that to American Jews. The American Jews were very supportive of LBJ and had a good relationship with him. LBJ had one problem in 1967. You know what that problem was? Vietnam. Not only did he have no support in Congress and Senate from the Republicans, he didn't even have support for another military campaign or military aid from his own Democratic Party. Remember one thing about LBJ. He doesn't run for re-election in 1968 because there's no way he would have won. He may not even, he maybe not, may not have even won the own, his own party. That's how bad it was for him. That's what Vietnam did to him. And he comes, Abba Eben. He meets with Secretary of State Dean Russ. He meets in the White House with Johnson, with Defense Secretary Robert McNamara and with Secretary of State Dean Ross. It's a very serious meeting. And he's saying, we could lose our existence. This could be Auschwitz too. And LBJ says to him this, you know, with his Johnson City, Texas accent. He says this, he says, you boys, he says, you're gonna shoot the first shot? You gonna start this thing? Because, you know, we got intelligence. We think you're all going to start this thing against the Mayorabs. He said, you go it alone. He says, you take the first shot. He says, then you got the moral high ground. Then you got the ethical high ground. And then we could try to help you. Which is not what Israel wanted to hear. No way, no how. What happened? Abba Ibn, you can YouTube it, he came out of that White House meeting, and these were his friends. De Gaulle is no friend of anybody, but Johnson was a supporter of Israel. Johnson cared for Israel, as did Dean Russ. 
came out of their ghost white. You know, Abba Ibn was never at a loss for words. And Johnson promised him, we're going to try to create an international convoy. Just sit, sit, wait. We're going to try to do an international convoy and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll break the, 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 the straits, the stranglehold on the straits of Iran. Johnson couldn't get any countries to join him. And he didn't want to be the only one because he wouldn't have the support from his own constituents. It was a terrible, terrible mess. So what does he do? So what does he do? You know what he did? Abba even goes home. In Levi Eshkol, it is so terrible. They do for the first time ever. They bring the leader of the opposition, Menachem Begin, Allah Vashalom. Menachem Begin, the head of the Cherut, the Likud party. They bring him into the cabinet and form an emergency mm -hmm. cabinet. The country is sitting shiver. It is a mess. Because what is Israel 1967? There were 2 million people. Most of them were Jews. About 75% were Jews. Who are they? These are the survivors of Europe. You know, th this, this is a Polish Jew who's lost everyone in his family. A Lithuanian Jew who's the only survivor of his town. A Hungarian Jew who's lost half of his relatives. They're reliving the Nazis all over again. 22 years later, who else is in Israel? The Sephardic communities from Egypt, from Tunisia, from Libya, the Sephardic Jews from Iraq, from Yemen, the, the Yemenite Jews, who are not Sephardim, but Yemenites. What do you think happens with them? They're reliving the horror of what their neighbors did to them, of what their countrymen did to them just, just 18 years ago, how they were driven out, what happened to their wives, what happened to their sisters how they were totally driven out. They barely escaped. Many of, their, many of their fellow Jews were killed. And they're listening to Nasser. They understand Arabic. They understand Arabic. And they're listening to Gamal Abdul Nasser talk this way. The country is traumatized. The country is digging graves all over the place. Kibbutz Be'eri, which is in the south, 10,000 graves. I'm sorry, what more than, I'm sorry, but I said it was wrong. 30,000 graves. 10,000 graves are, are dug in parks. Every park in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, there's a requisition of that land. And it's used for massive graves. Rabbi, Chief Rabbi Unterman took out, out of his own money, a full page ad in the newspaper saying, al people don't give up hope. We have Avinu Sheba Shemayim. Eila Varecha Ve'ela Vasusim. Right, they rely on their military power, which was far superior to Israel's. But we, we rely on God. We don't give up. It was terrible. Every able-bodied man was sent down to the south to the Egyptian border. By this time, there were 130,000 Egyptian troops in the Sinai and in Gaza. Israel was a very small army. There were 264,000 in total who were part of the army, but the large majority, 75% of them were Miluim. These were reservists. These were fathers. These were milkmen, kibbutznikim. These were professors. These were doctors who a couple weeks a year went on Miluim, but had been out of the army 10 years, 15 years. Every able-bodied man. The colleges had finished their classes in North America and in Europe and in South Africa. Jews from all over the world were coming to milk the cows on the kibbutzim, to deliver the mail, to fill the role that the men who had all gone down to the south for battle were, going, were leaving. And this Hamtana keeps going because I'll tell you what happened. There are two opinions here. The general staff, the general staff is the only group in all of Israel that's not in depression, that's not in depression mode. The general staff says, listen, and, and you should know this, Th think about your business or think about your company. We all do strategic planning. Hopefully we all do it and do it well. What happens if we lose this customer? What happens if we lose, lose this source of income? What happens if we lose our supply chain? 
How do we function and how do we stay alive as a business? So what did they do? They looked at what would be the worst case scenario. How can Israel survive a worst case scenario? And how would it happen? And in their strategic plan, this was already from a couple of years earlier. They said, what happens if we get attacked on all three sides? From the north by Syria and Lebanon, from the east by Jordan, and from the south by Egypt. Could Israel survive an attack like that? And they said only under one condition. Most likely we couldn't, but under one condition. If we did a preemptive strike, if we flew under radar and took out the Egyptian Air Force, if we were successful at that, then we could withstand the Syrian and the Jordanian Air Force, which is not as well trained. And then in a battle against the Egyptians, where we have air superiority, even though we are so outmanned and outtanked, we could defend the country. The idea was Operation Mokade and the specific idea of the preemptive strike while the Egyptian planes are on the ground, the MiG, the most powerful weapon in the Middle East, is absolutely impotent when it's on the ground. Its power is in the air. We'll fly under radar stream. It's called Nifza Sadan. Operation Anvil. Anvil. Boom. Take out the Egyptian Air Force. Okay? And they said to Navy Ashkol, take the hand cuts off. We're sitting here every day. There are more Egyptians on the, on the border. There are more Egyptian troops coming into Sinai. Every day, the Iraqis are sending more troops into Jordan. Take the handcuffs off and give us the element of surprise. If we sit here and wait, we're dead. We have a plan. Let us use it. And Levi Eshkol said, no, we're going to wait. And they were furious. They were furious with Eshkol. Levi Eshkol, this is the general staff. He's still alive. Shaiki Givash, General Givash, he was the head of the Pakud Dar Pakid Darom, the Southern Command. General Sharon was one of the three brigades under him. Remember, there were seven Egyptian brigades coming into the South. We had three to defend it. So you need that element of surprise. But what did Eshkol say to them? Are you kidding? Are, are you kidding? You're big, tough generals, right? You're an Israeli military guy, right? Yeah, you guys are tough. You're macho men. You're supermen. Let me ask you something. You heard what de Gaulle said. You heard what Wilson said from England. And you heard what Johnson and Dean Russ, who are friends, they said. We get no one. No one supports us. So we don't have a huge stockpile. Huh? We don't have any kind of stockpile. We're going to use our first mortar shells. We're going to use our first bombs. And what happens? We're going to use BB guns, squirt guns, pea shooters. Big boy, big tough Israeli generals, huh? What are you going to do when we're out of your munitions? And the general said back to him, you want to know something? You don't give us the first strike. It won't matter how many munitions we have. Do you know the carnage? Do you know the death toll? It was bad. It was bad. He got on the air because they said to him, you got to uplift the spirit of the country. And he did a live radio broadcast. Now understand, people didn't have television in 67. He does a live radio broadcast. The man hadn't slept. The man had a cold. And Levi Eshkol has, like every prime minister, he's got these guys who are speechwriters. So they're doing last minute tweaks. Now, it's not like today you go on the computer, you know what I mean? You print out a new speech. They're crossing out, they're putting squiggly lines. He can't read all the corrections. He's whiffing, he's like, he's wheezing and huffing and coughing. He gets on, he makes a speech that he's having a hard time reading and he's got a cold and he's, and he's congested. And the Jews are saying, we might as well say Kaddish now. It's over. This Shlomiel is running this place. Th this is supposed to be mechazek us. Now we're more depressed. It, it was terrible. It backfired. You want to know something? 
they had no choice to do so. It's not something they needed. This was not necessary, but it was done for psychological reasons. They brought Moshe Dayan, the man with the patch, the man they all hated. None of them could stand him. He was the smartest guy in the room. He let you know he was the smartest guy in the room. He was a guy you couldn't figure out. He was a chess player. He was a character. But one thing, the population out there looked up to him. And they felt if Moshe Dayan is the minister of defense, you know what? We got a chance. And they did that just to bring up the spirits of the people. Do you understand across the world, Jews never gave charity like that before or since. The money that was raised for Israel in May and June of 1967, it was incredible. People were taking second mortgages on their homes. There were fast days, there were prayer rallies, every federation across the globe. People gave like they never gave before because this was reliving the destruction of the Jewish people. This was, this was the Nazis all over again, all within a quarter of a decade. And it was a sad, scary time. And Nasser became emboldened as the world did nothing to help Israel. Nasser became emboldened. The Americans said to the Russians, you hold them back. You know, we're getting reports they're going to be attacking. You hold them back. Russians weren't necessarily uh, excited about holding them back, but the Russians wanted to make sure they wouldn't have another battleground with America. And they weren't sure would LBJ come in. So what happened? Israel is holding out three weeks of no economy, three weeks of depression of Malays, and three weeks of Nasser's speeches. More and more troops are getting closer and closer to the border. They send this time the head of the, of the Mossad. The head of the Mossad is very close with the head of the CIA. And this is two weeks later. LBJ has done nothing. There's no international convoy. There's nothing in Israel is just suffering. And he meets with them. And Robert McNamara is the Secretary of Defense of the United States. And in that meeting, he says, you know, we all figure, you boys, you going to do some preemptive action? You guys going to do a strike against some Arabs? We figure you take them out in three, four weeks. On the other hand, you take a hit from those boys. You let them Arabs, we think you're tough. And we think you don't have more guns. You don't have more tanks. You don't have more bullets, but you're better fighters than them. We think you're better trained. And we think you could win this thing. Won't be easy, be a lot of carnage, but we think you win this thing and we can back you under those conditions. And the head of the Mossad said to him, you know, American military intelligence had all kinds of assessments about Vietnam. And look at the mess you're in now. We don't have the luxury of your American military intelligence assessments being wrong. Because if you're wrong, we're dead. There's no Israel. There's no Jewish homeland. And he came back and he said, you know, unlike what Abba Ibn faced 10 days, 12 days ago, they're not, they're not letting us do this. But there's a difference between a red light and a yellow light. They understand they let us down. And they understand, they understand that they didn't do right by us. So they can't say, go for it. But there's a difference between no with Kavana and no. And this was a no that didn't really mean no. It was a yellow light. He returns on Chavez from Washington. And they plan the preemptive strike for Monday morning, June 5th, 7.45 a.m. There are basically two airstrips in Israel. In the Galilee, in Emek Israel, the Jezreel Valley, Ramat David, and in the south. Every plane, with the exception of 12 Israeli jets, is going to take off 7 o'clock from Ramat David, 7.15 from the Negev base in the south. They're going to fly under radar, incredibly dangerous. They're going to fly under radar, and here's the goal. We take out every landing strip except one, Sharm el Sheikh in the Straits of Tehran, because if we're successful, we need to land Israelis 
Israeli paratroopers there. We need to land supplies and troops there. Everything we're taking out, and they had incredible intelligence. They knew the same mistake that America made in the Philippines, which is why the Japanese slaughtered us in the Philippines. Our Air Force, the Egyptians made. They didn't have a constant system of Israeli, of Egyptian jets in the air. They all went out and did their early morning run. They came back for breakfast. The Frum guys, the religious pilots prayed. They did their morning prayer. They went into the canteen for breakfast. The non-religious ones got out of their planes and started breakfast early. The strike will take place between 735, 745. While everybody's eating breakfast, we're gonna take out all of the landing, the runways. They fly under radar through the sea, through the Mediterranean, through Jordan, on radio silence, on radio silence, and they, better than their best planning, boom, 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 they take it all out. They've been training during this Hamtana for weeks and how to refuel and reload bombs onto a plane, onto a French Mirage or a French Mystère. Under normal circumstances, it should take you about 30 minutes, 25 to 30 minutes. They had teams for every plane and they were doing it at a rate of seven to eight minutes a plane. So they come back 20 minutes back from the Sinai in these planes, boom, another hit. Because the second time we take out the planes, the planes, the Russian MiG jets, they can't get off the ground. There were very few MiG jets in the air. Almost everything was in the ground. And the MiG jets in the air, they had dogfights. There were some Israeli planes that were lost, but where they took out everything. General Amir at the time was in the air. He was in a plane just surveying his troops in the Sinai. He couldn't find a landing strip. His plane had to go all the way back to Cairo International Airport to land because every landing strip in air base was taken out. By 10.30, actually, let me say that differently. By 9.45 Monday morning, the Egyptian military was no longer. At this point, the word goes, the land under General Gavish, the three Brigades, Sharon's brigade, and they had incredible intelligence. The Egyptian soldiers had not had a lot of training. Over the last three weeks, they'd been moving in, moving in, moving in. They didn't, they weren't hunkered down. They didn't have bunkers built. And they didn't have a lot of training because this really was not something that was thought out and prepared in advance. Israel were well trained. And they took off. And they had air support. Not only were the landing strips taken out, not only were the Russian anti-aircraft batteries taken out, very similar to what is happening in Syria, now those Egyptian tanks that far outnumbered Israel, for if you're a plane from the sky, it's target practice. They're dead ducks. Boom, boom, boom. They are dead ducks. That's what happened. And Israel goes. Egypt's being slaughtered. And while there are certain Israeli soldiers fighting the Egyptian brigades, there are others that slip through. And that once you slip through the seven Egyptian brigades, you just cut right through the Sinai. And they cut right through the Sinai, which means you cut off the supply lines to the Egyptians. How do you like to have no supply lines out in the hot desert in June? Not getting water, not getting food, not getting fuel, not getting artillery. And they're headed down to Sharm el Sheikh. It defied the most objective assessments. Miracles. While this is going on, Nasser is on the phone to King Hussein of Jordan. You better be joining us. Our troops are in the Negev. We're at Be Beersheba. We took out the Israeli Air Force. We broke through their lines. We went through the Negev desert and now we're in Beersheba. You're gonna be there. We're gonna need you as we meet together in Jerusalem. 
Lady Eshkol through America is sending messages to Jordan. They're lying to you. They're lying to you. We've taken out their Air Force. They're getting slaughtered right now. He's setting you up for battle. We don't want to fight you. We don't want a war with you. Please back down. Don't attack us. And Nasser's going crazy. Where are you? Where are your troops? We're waiting for you. <laughs> You're King Hussein. Who are you going to believe, huh? You going to believe the stinking Jew? Or are you going to believe your fellow Arab? When your fellow Arab is lying through his teeth, making a fool out of you. So he was scared that if he didn't take action and join like he promised and he committed to, and they had Egyptian generals, you know, with his Royal Jordanian forces, he was afraid he'd have insurrection. He couldn't stand in the Arab world. And he believed Nasser. Biggest mistake this guy ever made. Now, stop for one second before we start with the battle for Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. Just one second. I left one fact out I want to share with you, which is part of the miracle of the story. Every week, now that there's one command, the United Arab Republic, there's a connection between Jordan's forces and Egypt's forces. And they know that Israel is doing a very good job of wiretapping. So instead of having wiretapping, what do they do? They change the codes. They change their codes of communication every Saturday night. Well, the Jordanians, Saturday night, we change our codes every week, once a week. You know what happened? The Egyptians didn't change the codes. So when these jets were flying over Jordan into Egypt, the Jordanians notified Egypt with a different system of communication because it's a new code system than the Egyptians were using. And the Egyptians didn't get the message. They didn't understand the message. That was a miracle. Go back to Jordan. Jerusalem is a split city. The Jordanians have barbed wire. No Jews been allowed to the holy sites since they drove us out in 1948. The west part of Jerusalem is Israeli. The east part of Jerusalem is Jordanian. You want to take the city? You have to control the two high points. The high point to the south, you all know, is Has Promenade. Anon, an, anon, I'm sorry, Armon Anetziv. What's Armon Anetziv? That's where the UN High Commissioner's post was. The high point to the north is Har Hatzofim, Mount Scopus. 10, 15. The Jordanians attack Armon and Atsiv. 1030, the Jordanians attack Hard Sofim. Hard Sofim is supposed to be neutral territory. Israel very smartly, secretly was sending soldiers and sending equipment there to have a, a force there. Now, who do you have in Jerusalem? The whole army is down in the south to try to stop the Egyptians. Who do you got in Jerusalem? Reservists. That's it. The Jerusalem Brigade in the north the Har El Brigade at Mount Scopus, and in the middle of the city, the 55th Brigade. Many of you have read Yossi Klein Levy's book about them. Many of you know the famous Rabbi Yol Ben Nun, who's a member of them. These were paratroopers, top Israeli soldiers, but these guys, they've been out of the army. You know, they, they were reservists. That's who you had. You didn't have many soldiers for, for Jerusalem. So the Har El Brigade in the north, the Jerusalem Brigade in the south, not only did they defend the city, not only did they defend the high places so that the Jordanians cannot come into Western Jerusalem and kill all the Jews living there, they actually win those battles and they fend off the Jordanians. Now we got a full-fledged war, not just between Egypt and Israel, between Jordan and Israel. Israel is successfully winning. The bloodiest battle, now keep in mind, there were 788 Jewish boys who were killed, Jewish soldiers who were killed in this war. 182 fell in the battle for Jerusalem. A huge amount died because of the hand-to-hand -hand combat. The bloodiest battle of all, which you know, is Givat Tachmoshet, Ammunition Hill. It was a bunker controlled by the Jordanian, the Royal Jordanian Army. 
Monday, late Monday night through early Tuesday morning, it was about a four or five hour battle, went till about 2.30 a.m. It was a bloodbath. You had hand-to-hand -hand shooting in trenches. But as Israel conquered Ammunition Hill, which was an important fortification, as they conquered the Rockefeller Museum, as they conquered all parts of East Jerusalem, between Monday morning when this thing started, until through Tuesday early a.m., meaning almost sunrise, incredible, incredible, in less than 30 hours, I'm sorry, what I said was wrong. It was less than, let's see, 10 a.m., in less than 20 hours, Israel had conquered most of Yerushalayim. But Moshe Dayan said, we're not going to fight for the old city. We're not doing that. Very simple reason. I don't want World War III. How would you love to, for us to conquer Har Habayit, the Temple Mount, and then you don't have four Arab nations. You'll have the whole Arab world against us. I'm not doing that. This started out as a defensive war. I understand what the Jordanians are doing to us is wrong. Two men, Menachem Begin, who's part of the Minister Without Portfolio, part of the, the emergency cabinet, and Yigal alone. Now, Begin is a Jew. Begin's a real Jew with a sense of Jewish history, Jewish knowledge. Yigal alone was a socialist, but he had Jewish history and Jewish knowledge. They came to, to Tuesday night to Levi Eshkol. Eshkol may be a part of the Mapai party, party, which is you know socialist from a political point of view. But Levi Eshkol grew up with a Jewish education. He grew up in a religious home in the Ukraine. And they said to him, God will never forgive you. Jewish history will never forgive you. Alone didn't say God, Begin said that. Jewish history, you have the opportunity to re after two millennia, after 2,000 years of us being refugees to return to our holy city, and you're doing nothing? Are you crazy? We're, we're fighting against the clock. They're already trying to shut us down at the UN in New York. And they shook Eshkol. Can you not understand you're in, a, you're in a position of Jewish destiny? And Eshkol called an emergency. This was Tuesday night. He called an emergency cabinet meeting, 7 a.m. in the bunker of the Knesset, because the Jordanians were still shooting, lofting. They were trying to blow up the Knesset. So they went into the bunker below the Knesset, and they had an emergency, emergency meeting. Diane is such a chess player. He watches it. Everybody agrees. We must take the Iratika. We must give us once again access to the Kotel. To have Harabayit be Adenu, Yerushalayim, that's our capital. That's the capital from the time of Avram Avinu, from the Akedas Yitzchak. That's what David established as the first capital. How can we not? After being gone from there 2,000 years, how can we stop? So as the votes went around, Dayan said he was going to lose, he voted yes. So you all know the story. Uz, General Uzi Narkis blows the gate in Shar Arayot. And the paratroopers go in. They didn't know Yerushalayim. By the way, the, the, the fighting in Yerushalayim was so bloody. You had guys that would, the first guy would go around the corner. He would be shot at by a Jordanian sniper, more often than not being killed. But he would take the bullets. They knew where the sniper was. So the second and third guy could shoot, go around the corner and shoot the sniper. You had guys throwing their bodies over barbed wire so the second and third guys could get through. These guys were incredible. And they hadn't had much sleep in the last two days. Wednesday morning, they come in. The old city, all white flags. The Arabs have white flags. up. There are a few snipers, a few Jordanian snipers. And they ask them, where's the Harabayit? And the Arabs take them and they come up to the Harbai. Now understand this, that's the high point. For Yoel bin Nun, who grew up learning the Mishnayos of Mesech the Tamid, of Mesech the Midos, and he appreciated what the Harbai was, the Beit HaMikdash was. This was incredible. The first Jew on this spot 
since the time of the Romans. This was incredible. They took with them. A, um, a woman came to them early in the battles on Monday. And she had what looked like a shmata. You know what it was? It was a 19-year-old Israeli flag. It was a flag that's all she could take with her. She lived in the old city of Jerusalem. And she brought that flag crying to them. She says, I was one of the last to leave when the Jordanians drove us out. Please take this flag with you when you come in and you liberate, and you emancipate that which was, you know, the majority of Jerusalem was, was Jewish inhabitants throughout the Ottoman records. Jerusalem was always a majority of Jews and we were driven out by the Jordanians 19 years earlier. So what do they do? When they get up to the Temple Mount, they raise over the, over the mosque, over the Temple Mount on the flagpole, they raise the Israeli flag, the flag this woman had given them. Moshe Dayan is sitting in Harat Sofim, which was conquered on Monday. And he's got the binoculars. He goes nuts. He says, you take that flag down. He says, are you crazy? You want a war? You're going to fly an Israeli flag over the shrine of Omar, over Al-Aqsa Mosque? Are you nuts? I'll come down there. I'll rip your heads off your shoulder. You take that stinking thing down now. So they pulled down the flag. Now, most of these paratroopers were not the Yol Benuns. They weren't religious, didn't appreciate Harabayit. But the one thing they all knew from their grandparents, that all their grandparents would come to them from Europe, is the Kotel Hamaravi. They all heard the stories about the Kotel Hamaravi. And they asked the Arabs, where are, where's the Kotel? They take them down the Mugrabi Gate and they discover a garbage dump. The Arabs, with their disgusting disrespect of Jewish history, they turned it into a, a place of shanties and, and you know, people who were vagabonds and vagrants. And, and, you know, and, and they, they started clearing it out. Now, the chief rabbi of Tzahal, the famous rabbi Shlomo Gorin, he was fighting with the troops in Gaza. When he hears that the Jordanians struck and that we're fighting for Yerushalayim and that we're winning Yerushalayim, he told his driver, head back, we're heading to join the paratroopers in Yerushalayim. Their jeep was shot at by Egyptian soldiers. It was called the Palestinian Brigade. That was a brigade the Egyptians had in Gaza. His driver actually died from his wounds. Gorin drove the jeep the rest of the way. He goes to his father-in-law's home, the Nazir, Rabbi David Cohen, who was a student of Rav Kook, the famous Nazir. That's Shlomo Gorin's father-in-law. He's a short man, Rabbi Gorin, but he's a, a lion of a man, a lion of a man. And he has to get up on a chair and he gets his father-in-law's shofar and he brings the shofar with him. And they join the boys at the Koto. Now you've all seen the picture of Rabbi Gorin. The backstory is this lion of a man was so overcome, couldn't get a sound out. He was a great Baltokea, great show for Blore. He couldn't get a sound out. What does he do? He gives the shofar over to one of the boys who blows it, he recomposes. And he takes these paratroopers and they say Kaddish for their brothers, their fellow brothers in arms who have conquered the city of Jerusalem with their lives, who have given their lives. And you can see the JNF we did, Ammunition Hill, it's all there in Gibat Tachach Moshe. And what they do is they say Kaddish together and they're crying and they say Shechiyanu Vikimanu and they say the Hallel. It's an incredible moment. Most of these guys were not religious but he taught them how to pray. It was an incredible moment for them. You've all seen when Moshe Dayan wrote a note and put it in the Kotel. When King Hussein hears that he's lost Jerusalem, the holy city, he tells the Royal Jordanian army, they were his crack soldiers, retreat, they're gonna, Cross the Jordan River. He was afraid that the, the Arabs in Jordan would, would overthrow him, would be so furious they'd come after him. He was afraid for his own, his own regime. And the ones who are loyal to him, the Royal Jordanians, he, bring, he tells them to come back and they retreat. 
Now, when the Bedouin Jordanian soldiers and when the other Jordanian soldiers who are not the elite units see that the Royal Jordanians are retreating, they all start retreating. By Wednesday afternoon, remember the Kotel was conquered Wednesday morning? By Wednesday afternoon, all of Judea, the Gush, Beit Lechem, the Judean hills, Hebron, the, the Wak gives over the keys to the to, to Malat Machpela, to the soldiers, to, to Rabbi Golan. Without very few bullets, it was a miracle that because of their fear, they all retreated back across the river. Judea was conquered. By Thursday, the next day, day four of the war, Samaria, Shomron, Beit El, Shechem, all the Makomos HaKadoshim, our history, our Tanakh, what is the real heartland of the Jewish people? All of it is conquered. Very few, very little battles. There were some. And now Israel's no longer nine miles wide. Israel's defensible. The Jordan River. Now we have the water source of the Jordan River. We can defend against all these terrorists coming into us. It's a different world. While all this is going on, while Egypt is scared to death that Israel is going to come into Cairo because Israel has now opened up the straits. We now control Sharm el-Sheikh in the Straits of Tehran. We control the Sinai. The Egyptian soldiers, many of them just gave up. Many of them fled back to Egypt. Tremendous cowardice. All that Soviet equipment was either destroyed or taken by Israel. Moshe Dayan does not want a third war. Now, the Syrians have been shooting down from the heights, the Golan Heights, which is overlooking the Galilee. They, for years, had been killing Jewish farmers on their tractors. They, for years, had been taking sniper target, sniper practice, shooting at farmers in those Galilean villages in Kibbutzim. And these guys who make up something known as the Golani Brigade, they're begging, they're begging and asking, let us once and for all liberate. We've been living 20 years. Our children are traumatized. They've been living in bomb shelters and in bunkers for 20 years. Give us the chance. Wednesday night, the head of the Northern, you know, the, I'm sorry, it's called the, I think, Pakit Safon, the Northern Command, what, what General Gavish was in the South, that's what General Dado Elazar, David Elazar, known as Dado, he was the one who became the head of the IDF, unfortunately, during the, the, six, the 73 war, the Yom Kippur War. He traveled from the Galilee all the way to the, what they call the Boar in Tel Aviv. That's where the underground strategic room is for the IDF, where all the chief generals are. He beg, begged Levi Eshkol. He begged Moshe Dayan. Dayan said, just take it, suck it up and take the hits. We don't want a war on three fronts. I don't have the soldiers to give you. The UN is trying to shut this thing down. America is helping us, trying to hold it off. But at any moment, we could be shut down. What am I going to do? We're going to lose all these soldiers for naught? Just take the hits. I don't want an offensive up there. Dato's screaming and the people are screaming for it, even though the children have all been evacuated from the north. They want to fight. And by the way, this is impossible. You understand the Galilee is down here. To go up, you've all been on the roads when your ears pop on the bus as you're going up to the Golan Heights. Can you imagine having to do that by hand? You can't get tanks up there. Thursday night, Dayan changes. And he gives Dado Elazar the green light. And there's going to be two approaches. They're going to come from the southern Golan Heights up the mountains to conquer the southern Golan Heights, and they're going to come around the northern ridge. And that's the famous story when they come around the northern ridge. Now understand, you've got all these trenches. You know the stories of the eucalyptus trees and the Syrian soldiers are not obvious. Even if Israel's Air Force bombs, you don't, you, it's not like you can see. It's not like the Sinai Desert that you see where the Egyptian tanks are, and boom, 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 you hit them. Everything is camouflaged up there. It's not so simple. The only way you can go is climbing the mountains in the, in the privacy of darkness. 
in the, so to speak, the cover of darkness. They're climbing with massive weights on their back. And then in the morning before dawn, trying to strike in the bunkers. We lost a lot of guys, a lot of guys. And if any of you go to the Jezreel Valley, Amek Israel, there's a famous memorial to the Golani Brigade. To all, what is the Golani Brigade? And a memorial to the soldiers who were lost in the different wars. And you can see there the story of these guys who gave their lives for the Jews of the North, the Jews of the Galilee. And it's incredible after vicious, hard fighting, they conquer against all odds. They conquer those bunkers in the Northern Golan Heights. And then reinforcements can come. Very few of the first fighters survived, three, but the reinforcements come and they take the heights. And they said, we didn't come here Friday morning for 75 meters and they move forward. The same miracle that happened with Jordan, where the king was afraid he'd be overthrown. Because you have to understand, on the road from Damascus to Kunetra, Kunetra is the city in the Golan Heights. On the road from Damascus to Kunetra, there were five brigades of Syrian soldiers. The government pulled all of them back to protect Damascus, the capital city because they were afraid Israel was coming. It's not very far to Damascus. And what do they do? They retract and they recoil. And here come the Israelis with all the Syrian soldiers running away, retreating this huge battle that's gonna be for the whole Golan Heights is not, just like there wasn't much of a battle for Judea or for Samaria. And they conquer the Golan Heights without much of a, again, the initial was a terrible battle. I'm talking about the majority of the land. Friday in the UN, the Russians are going crazy. They're going crazy because this thing should have been stopped way in advance. And Arthur Goldberg, he's an amazing hero of the story. He wanted to become a, and he should have been by rights. He was worthy. He was a great legal mind, should have been a Supreme Court justice. But he wasn't because they had to give it to someone else politically. You know, so you don't want to have a Jew there, a name like Goldberg. They gave him as a booby prize. You'll be represented. You'll be the United States ambassador to the UN. That was a huge letdown for him as opposed to being a lifetime appointment of being a Supreme Court justice. God had plans for Arthur Goldberg. And he was a great Zionist. Arthur Goldberg played the role of trying to delay and delay and negotiate and delay and say, no, this is not something that we can support. And he kept pushing it off so Israel could defend itself and Israel could conquer land that would make a future peace agreement. That's what Israel was thinking, viable, that would protect the country from the kind of terrorism that they lived under the first 20 years of their existence. The Russians, he couldn't push it off anymore. And what happened? He expects that it's going to be a ceasefire. The Syrian ambassador, the Syrian ambassador gets up there and says, there's not going to be any ceasefire. Ceasefire? Are you kidding me? They're going to give back every stinking inch and every stinking centimeter they took. And then the Egyptian ambassador goes on and they start attacking and cursing and condemning Israel that they're an aggressor and that they're a this and they're a that and that there's no ceasefire until they relinquish and retreat from every inch that they've stolen from. Bah, 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 bah. The Russian ambassador to the UN is going crazy. I don't believe these idiots. I don't believe these fools. They were planning on annihilating Israel. Instead, they get annihilated. And then they have the, the audacity and the stupidity to keep this thing going. And that's what, why Dayan changed and he gave the green light for the attack on Syria. Because he's a, he understood, you can't live the way Jews were living, being attacked all the time by these bombs and these mortar shells and these rifle attacks from the Syrians. And he gave the green light. But now Russia's had enough. I don't care how stupid the Arabs have been. I don't know how ridiculous they've been. We've been humiliated. It was our military attaches that, that, that trained them. It was our 
planes that were knocked out of the sky. It was our tanks that were turned into charcoal. Enough! Dayenu! And they sent naval bombers into the Mediterranean. Their naval bombers going into the Mediterranean, and we don't know what their intentions were. Was it a scare tactic, or were they really going to attack? Come into Haifa port and attack. And Israel calls LBJ. And without getting into it, Israel made a mistake. They took out the USS Liberty and their American seamen who died. They call LBJ. And LBJ changes American Israel relations with, th with three words. He changed everything. There are two three word statements that are some of the most famous in Jewish history. When Matagor, the leader of the 55th Brigade of Terror Paratroopers, the reservists, when he gets on the line to Moshe, Moshe Dayan and he says, Har Habayit Biadenu, Har Habayit Biadenu, the Temple Mount is under our control. Those are the most famous three words that any Jew has said in the last 300 years. Har Habayit Biadenu. That was on Wednesday morning. This is Friday. And LBJ gets on the line to the Admiral of the United States Navy. And he says, Admiral, this is the commander in chief talking. This is President Johnson, your commander in chief. Where is the location of the sixth naval fleet? And he tells him, a couple hundred meter um, kilometers off of Cyprus. And the commander in chief says, this is your commander in chief. Turn it around. Did you hear me? Turn it around. And he let the Russians know he was sending the sixth naval fleet for Haifa port. Now, America did not want a second Vietnam, and I don't think Russia wanted a second Vietnam, not after what they'd been gone through. And we don't know if there would have been. But at the same time, they called Israel, and they said, listen, guys, you're going to shut this down. We're not interested in World War III. We don't have the backing for World War III. We got enough problems in Vietnam, and we're not looking to play a game of chicken with the Soviet Union. You're going to shut this down. So Israel said, just ask Arthur Goldberg, get us till Saturday night. This is late Friday night. Get us one more day. We'll call the ceasefire for Saturday night. And Goldberg was able to do that. The Russians would back down. The Americans would back down from each other. And they would announce at 6 p.m. They announced it Saturday morning in the UN that 6 p.m. New York time, 6 p.m. New York time is going to be a ceasefire. I apologize what I said. It was actually 6 p.m. Mideast time. I'm sorry, 6 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. New York time. There's going to be a ceasefire. They announced this late Friday night. 11 a.m. tomorrow morning will be a ceasefire. Israel knows the same water sources that provided the only water for the country could be shut off again. In those last hours, they do everything they do and they are able to conquer the Hermon mountain range. They get the peaks of the Hermon and they plant an Israeli flag at 2 p.m. And I'll tell you why. Because Dado Elazar told all of his captains and colonels, you got to 3 p.m. If he tells them 3 p.m., look, you know how it is. You know, you tell a rabbi you got five minutes, in his mind, we, you know, I think that means nine or 10 minutes. No, no, you really meant five, but in my mind, I think it's nine. You tell these soldiers who are being successful, you got till 2 p.m., maybe you'll get a ceasefire by six. So I apologize. He told them 3 p.m. Israel time, which gave a little bit of leeway. 2 p.m., they got the flag planted on the Hermon. Never again. Will the Syrians be able to dam up our water supplies and choke us off at the Banyas and choke us off at the Hizbani like they did before? The Banyas and the Hizbani are ours. We can have water to, to, to give our people. The war stopped at 3 p.m. Israel stopped. They didn't go further. 
Israel was three times the land mass it was five and a half days ago. All of the holy sites, all of everything that shaped the Jewish people, all of Jewish history, we now had access to. For the first time, could we say, and by the way, he's talking about the first time. It was the first time in 2,000 years in the annals of all of human history, in the annals of all of human history, the first time that after 2,000 years as refugees, as greeners, as exiles, a people had returned to its holy site. Prime Minister Netanyahu was a real sense of Jewish history. He has a sense of history that not every Jew has. He says, we were Israel before 1967. But it wasn't Jewish. There was no Beit Lechem, there was no Jerusalem, there was no Hebron, no Shechem, no Beit El. For the first time in 1967, Israel became the homeland of the Jewish, the Jewish homeland. Jewish history was not in Tel Aviv. It was Jerusalem and Beit El and Shechem and Hebron and Beit Lechem. I, I heard many times, to, actually, I shouldn't say this. I heard it person twice. He said it to me. Natan Sharansky said, you don't know what 1967 was to, to Soviet Jewry. We hated ourselves. We were discriminated against. You had to have Ivrei on the Hebrew, Ivrei on, your, your, on your, your identity card. We loathed ourselves because they loathed us. You didn't know what it meant to be a Jew. It would have just have been a matter of time until we, we would have assimilated out. Who wanted to be a Jew? Who wanted to be anything but? He says, you know, in those moments leading up to the war, the last days, we understood it, the Soviet TV, TAS, you know, the, the uh, Soviet national TV. It's, it's all fake. We know that. But you want to know something? When we saw the images of Israelis digging sandbags and di digging thousands of graves, to prepare for the slaughter. We were scared. Those were supposedly our people and they were going to suffer again. And when against everything that Tas reported and claimed and bragged about, when literally David defeated Goliath, when tiny little Israel defeated four Arab armies, and all of the superior dominant Soviet military equipment with the Soviet military attaches. Oh my God, Sharansky says, they hated us even more. They hated us even more. But the difference was for the first time ever, they respected us because we were the people of the Jewish homeland. We were the cousins of those Israelis when that little Jewish country could stand up to the great Soviet Union and humiliate it in less than a week, that was the first time we started to respect ourselves. When they respected us, we started to respect ourselves. And that's when the Hebrew language classes, the Chumash classes, that's when we started studying Jewish history. That's when these clandestine minyanim and when young Soviet Jews started to go to the few prayer services that were just attended by elderly people, everything changed. We would have been assimilated out. There would have been no Jews left two generations later. The Six Day War changed everything. It started the whole movement. In America, other than Satmar Hasidim, what Jew would walk on the street with a yarmulke? You were embarrassed to wear a kippah. You put on a kippah in your house if you were eating. You put on a kippah in the synagogue. Nobody walked around with a yarmulke. Jewish pride in America started. The whole Balchuva movement started. The whole Balchuva movement. We wouldn't be a Judaism today without the Balchuva movement. 30% of us in the Orthodox community were not raised in an Orthodox home. That was all functioning the Six Day War. That was the catalyst for everything. Not just Sammy Davis Jr. and Elizabeth Taylor. I'm talking about Jews. Something else that happened after the Six Day War. You had survivors all over the world that after what they lost and after what they saw and after what they experienced, they had a broken relationship with Hashem, with God. 
They had a broken relationship with Judaism. They couldn't understand where was Hashem and where was the Almighty between 1935 and 1940, 1939 and 1945, when after the whole world was expecting a second Auschwitz and a second Treblinka and a second Belgians and a second Panari and a second Romulus, when what happened happened, when that undefendable tiny little sliver of land became defendable, when Jews could again go to the Kotel, those Jews had a raproshma in their relationship with God Almighty. They had a raproshma in their relationship with Judaism. There was a whole transformation, a whole turn that took place in Canada and South Africa and America and Western Europe. And Jews returned to God and to Judaism. And you know why? Because when they started going to Israel, the highlight became Friday night at the Kotel. In Yeshiva, it started. Rav Bina started this. Rav Aram Bina. He started it. I apologize. Rav Arya Bina. Rav Bina's father, Rav Arya, started with Yeshiva at a Kotel. And one by one, the old city became a Makam Torah. Tens and tens of female, of, of seminaries for women, of Yeshivas for men, of Bali Tshuva Yeshivas, of Esha Torah. And the highlight of every trip to Israel was going to the Kotel, was that Friday night dinner in the old city. And then when Rav Amital and Rav, Rav Aaron went and established the Gush Yeshiva, and Jews started to settle Judea and Samaria, which was the homeland of the Jews historically from the time of the Bible. That small little country of two million citizens. Today, only 50 some years later, 53 years later, it's over 9 million, 75% are Jews. It was that war that enabled Judaism to expand, Jewish people to expand, a population growth in Israel. That six days, the Jews saw that the God of Hashgach and the God of history is there. The Jewish blood is no longer cheap. The Jewish blood is not something that can be strewn all over the place. And it opened opportunities religiously, spiritually. It opened opportunities politically. It opened opportunities in terms of basic safety and security in the homeland. No longer will the high places be a, a vehicle to shoot down a plane going, over, going into Ben Gurion Airport. No longer will the high places be used as a source to attack us in the valleys. Now we control the high places, the Jordan Valley. And Israel, the Israel of our fathers and our progenitors and of King David and King Shlomo, the Israel of Rabbi Akiva, the Israel of Ezra. That's our Israel. And we've grown over fourfold in those 50 short years. And the demographers expect us to be over 12 million by 2050. We need a place for those Jews to live, to settle. And this is the heartland of our country. Those six days, we've never had the hand of God so apparent, so apparent since the time of the Hanukkah miracles, where a small, the Ma'atim defeated the Rabbim, where the Tahorim defeated the Tameim. And God blessed us, every one of us, to live in a world in the aftermath of this story, in the aftermath of this nace, in the aftermath of the rebirth of the Jewish people. That's what those six days in June gave us. Today, we celebrate the liberation of Yerushalayim. We celebrate the return of our people to its ancestral capital to Eretz Yisrael HaShlema, to the restoration of a Jewish people after 2,000 years. I ask of you one thing. When you and I say, Modim Anach thank God that God gave us the blessing 
that God gave us the opportunity to live in this generation, in the generation where Yerushalayim, to quote Matagur, Har Habayit Beadenu, Yerushalayim Yer Kodesh Beadenu, Eretz Yisrael Beadenu, and that we've brought our people home as a function of this miracle from behind the Iron Curtain, from throughout the lands of our dispersion. And once again, Israel is the heart and soul. It's the foundation and center of Am Yisrael. And no other place like Israel has the Torah of Israel blossomed as a function of this miracle, exploded as a function of this miracle, that the Jews and God have been returned, restored to our home, Eretz Yisrael. Thank you. And Yom Yerushalayim Sameach. Chag Sameach. And thank God that we live in this generation.